All right, y'all, it's 2.30. Uh, everybody out there in Zoom land, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Very good. I really, really appreciate everybody being here for this. Um, this is something that we want to sort of set up as a annual thing in terms of a CNCC and other partners hosting water education seminars. And so this is the first one we're running and uh, your participation is just much appreciated. And if there's any uh, feedback y'all have after this is done, uh, do not hesitate to contact me and uh, let me know. We wanna make these things as impactful and meaningful as possible. And so we can get started on time. I'd first like to introduce our introduce our guest speaker, uh, Lindsay DeFrades from the Colorado River District. Lindsay is a PR specialist. And I think Lindsay's talk is gonna overlap with mine just a little bit, but uh, we're really trying to set the stage for why we are here and thinking about water conservation in the first place. And so with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Lindsay. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Mario. Uh, it's nice to be on with you all. It's uh, kind of a gloomy day down here in Glenwood Springs, but we've gotten some more snow on the ground this morning. Surprise, surprise. And that's always appreciated this time of year. Um, so yeah, as um, Mario said, I work for the Colorado River District, and I'm going to kind of go through uh, my PowerPoint slides, but I'll try not to teach through the slide too much. Um, if you give me one sec to share my screen, we will get that started. And I do apologize if some of this is review for those in the audience, um, and, or, or if some of it goes off the deep end. It's always hard to gauge with um, a water talk exactly how deep to go. So we always aim for somewhere in the middle. So I appreciate your patience if I don't get it quite right. And of course, um, I'd be happy to take any questions at the end and I will try not to talk too fast. And yeah, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So West Slope Water, the 1922 compact and the call for conservation. These are the kind of major issues in our, in our water, Western water world right now. But for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the Colorado River District, we were formed in 1937 by a state charter. So we are a small government um, agency to protect West Slope water users. Um, we came about, let's see, I'm gonna skip that one for now. Uh, we came about because people in the small communities on the Western Slope woke up several mornings and read in the newspaper that trans basin diversions to the already booming populations on the Front Range were going to increase. And they recognized that um, they were gonna have to have a united voice to be able to advocate for their own water interests um, to balance out just the numbers and the economics of the growing population on the Front Range, which is why our organization was founded. So we cover here, you can see these 15 counties, this outline in blue on the top is us. And that those 15 counties include the basins of the Yampa White Green, uh, the main stem of the Colorado, and then of course the Gunnison and the Uncompahgre River down below. Within these 15 counties, and this will be important in a little bit, um, is contained the snow and precipitation that creates about 65% of the natural flows of the Colorado River down at Lee Ferry, which is there in the middle in red um, by Lake Powell. So if you add our sister organization, the Southwest Conservation District there in the Dolores and the San Juan, um, that's gonna be closer to 70%. So the Western Slope of Colorado is hugely important whenever we are discussing um, the health of the seven states and more than 40 million people who depend on this basin. On this map, you can see outlined in gray, these dark areas, um, those are urban centers which actually depend on water from the Colorado River Basin, but whose mass falls outside of the basin itself. So all of those gray areas, the Colorado Front Range, the Wasatch Front, uh, the metroplexes of uh, San Diego and Los Angeles, and then central New Mexico, all of those areas depend on water from the Colorado River, but they, they pump it across where the water would naturally flow, hence trans-basin diversions. 
So this is us, 1937, um, banded together, 15 counties. And right now, my organization works in several different ways to accomplish our mission, which is to uh, protect the West Slope, West Slope water. And we have three different branches, as long as you remember that I count as one, two, with information and outreach. So first off, we have legislative, um, not a legislative branch, but we have Director of Government Relations, Zane Kessler, who works with elected officials um, throughout the state and the nation to make sure that West Slope water interests are being heard in the rooms where policy is being made and where people are voting to make sure that though we are smaller in number that our presence is always felt. Uh, then we have a lot of engineers who provide technical support to water users across our basins, um, whether we are looking at upgrading older infrastructure or um, evaluating studies and science and data to make sure that those policymakers have the best available information to make their decisions, we do that as well. And then we also have a legal team which makes sure that the water disputes that inevitably end up in court um, are fairly treated and that we can speak for them at that level as well. So all in total, it sounds like we do a lot and we do. There's about 22 employees in our office here in Glenwood Springs, and we have been very busy lately. All right, so I think I'm going to kind of get this slide. I'm going to let Mario talk about the actual um, vocab, and we'll come back to that, though, if there's more questions. So something that's important to keep in mind, um, why, why are we seeing so much more about this topic um, in headlines? in discussions in government agencies, even in backyard barbecues, I have been cornered. So I hear Lake Powell's really low this time. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the fact that we are experiencing a multi-decadal hot drought, which is the worst on record in over 1200 years, um, judging by tree rings, as far as the growth and the amount of water and precipitation in the soils when those, when those trees were growing. So the word unprecedented is very unpopular. We're all sick of hearing it, but this is where we are. So this, a quick summary of why this drought has been so impactful. For every one degree Fahrenheit rise in average temperature, stream flow is reduced uh, between three and 9%. Most studies now you can see on the bottom um, of the page there, I'm citing my studies, say it's closer to 9%. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is summers are coming earlier. If you are an irrigator or you love an irrigator, you probably know that the ditches and the streams are having to flow a lot sooner to keep the soil able to grow. It's just, we're turning on water earlier in the summer than we ever have before because of the hot and dry conditions coming in sooner. That means that the snowpack, the snowpack that creates that 65 to 70% of the natural flow of the Colorado River, is being um, drawn out earlier. So it's like when you, get a, when you get a paycheck, spending it all in the first week of the month. It's a bit of an exaggeration, first two weeks maybe. Um, but that's changed a lot, those, those earlier summers. And then the hot summer temperatures, we've seen mega wildfires across the state for many of the past few years. Fortunately, none last summer within our state. Um, but a lot of that has to do with the same thing. All of these dry, hotter conditions also create the soil moisture deficit so that after we get through a summer, we go into fall, we start banking snow again, but when that snow melts in the spring, it has to meet the thirst of the soil before it can make it into the river. So again, if we're thinking about the metaphor of a bank account where the snow is our savings, um, the soil moisture would be the bills. It's your overhead, right? You got to pay mortgage, turn the heat on pay, or pay rents and buy food for people. And that's the soil moisture. It has to be met before water can find its way down into the streams and rivers to flow towards irrigation, towards municipal. Um, this, sorry, I have uh, kids and pets in the background. I apologize. Um, all of that has to be met. So this is actually old. It's funny. I was just looking today. I'm going to jump around here. Bear with me. I was just looking, nope, I lost it. The new soil moisture um, graph from the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center is up and it does look a little better, but it has a surprising amount of uh, yellows and oranges in it still. So you can see this is 2020 and 2021. They take the measure right here in November, right before we start banking our snow so that uh, water forecasters can use this information when they are predicting how much of this water is gonna make it into the river next spring. And I can tell you right now, um, the entire basin is fixated 
on the snowstorms that we are getting here on the western slope of Colorado. The 40 million people, the hundreds of millions of dollars in economy um, from here to California, they're watching our snowstorms roll through because we create that bank in such a large percentage um, that all of these people depend on. So if you can go to the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, I recommend it. Their updates are fantastic and we rely on them heavily in my job. One of the other crunches that we are facing with water in the West and in Colorado and across the Southwest is population growth. In the state of Colorado right now, we have approximately 5.5 million people. In the Western Slope in our district, we have about 500,000, just as that perspective on our, the size of our voices again. By 2050, the state is going to almost double to 9 million and the Colorado River Basin as a whole, which currently holds about 40 million people or more, is expected to jump to 76 million. Now, I know a lot of us who moved to the Western Slope enjoy the elbow room and came for the space. Population growth is happening across the world right now. In my lifetime, the entire population of the earth has doubled almost. And there's really no reason to go forward expecting that we're not going to see this, a similar metric where we're living um, as much as we miss perhaps um, the quiet uh, of, of several decades ago. People like to live where it's sunny. We, it's a beautiful place to be out here. We, we're going to have more residents and we need to look ahead and make sure that we are taking that into account when we do these water, these long-term water planning decisions. So coming back to the Colorado River District, our mission is twofold. We have our West Slope mission, which I talked about helping water users on the West Slope be able to cope with changing conditions to make sure that their voices are being heard. We also have an interstate part of our mission. In the state charter that formed us, uh, the line is, um, and to advocate for the water to which the state of, of Colorado is entitled. So part of the, what we do within our office is to make sure that we are involved in those conversations between the seven basin states the ones that have been getting perhaps the most headlines. Now, Mario, you can interrupt me if I'm going too far in the wrong direction here, because I was going to include a little bit of a look at what those interstate discussions are, but if maybe we want to pause and go back to some of the basics, um, just let me know, I'll give you a chance to weigh in there. Let's go ahead with it, because I think in terms of the terminology, that might set up some nice context. Okay, great. Yeah, and again, just, um, keep questions, please. I'm always happy to answer them. Just write them down um, and, or put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, all right, so then the interstate, there's seven basin states. That means that anything we do together, the compact itself um, is at a federal level. We all have to agree. So quick history, trust me, I'm gonna make this as brief as I can. Why the 1922 compact and what is it? So here's the map of the basin again. You can see those heavy areas of population growth. Those have always been growing faster than our West Slope area. Because when um, this area here by Los Angeles looked like this, uh, Colorado and the Western Slope looked a lot more like this. And before the 1922 compact was put together, the entire basin was governed by the tenant of first in time, first in right. So if you developed your water right first, you put a year on it and a use on it, and that's, that was your priority. But what happened was that these big areas in Southern California were growing so fast, they were basically calling dibs on a huge amount of water in the Colorado River. In fact, to this day, Colorado or California, it has a huge amount of water that is pre-compact, um, vastly bigger than most of the other states. So the representative from Colorado said, this is not going to work for us. By the time we catch up with these humongous areas of growth, um, there won't be any more water rights for us to claim. So what they decided was to split the river into two. They estimated the volume of the flow to be around 17.5 million acre feet, which will come to as being a bit of an overestimation. And they split it in the middle at Lee Ferry. And they said, upper basin states, you're gonna go ahead and get half of the river's flow, this equitable apportionment and lower basin states, you're gonna get about half of the river's flow. So the upper basin states are Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Colorado, and the lower basin states, California, Nevada, and Arizona. And they each got half of, at the time, they didn't even use up what they, they thought they would come back and divide up the surplus. They split 15 million acre feet, giving each of those upper basin and lower basin um, 
sorry, 7.5 million acre feet to develop separately. So that meant that if Utah didn't, didn't develop all of its water rights immediately and California and Nevada did, that they weren't gonna take Utah's right because the upper basin got 7.5 or actually it's measured as 75 over 10 years. So it averages out to 7.5 million acre feet um, that the upper basin could develop it at their own pace. And everybody thought that that made a lot of sense, but some things have changed. Go back to the, everything we just talked about with the hot drought and the population increase. And things are starting to be a lot more out of balance than the original uh, founders of the compact ever could have imagined. Because in addition to this number, <laughs> something I'm not even gonna go into besides just saying it, is that we do owe this amount of water to the country of Mexico. So part of the compact later on um, is actually an international treaty, but I don't have time for that today. So what you're seeing here is that the actual use is not 50-50. The upper basin states tend more toward that 4.4 million acre feet and the lower basin states almost double that. There's lots of reasons for that. Um, we're gonna go into a few of them. I'm gonna try and keep it simple. Um, a quick overview is that it comes down to the fact that lower basin, lots of facts, but one of them is um, the lower basin, when they call for water, they get that amount. Yet in between us and them is this massive pot of evaporation in Lake Mead and all of the transit losses of water seeping in through ditches or faulty pipes or infrastructure, et cetera. So the lower basin continually is able to overuse their allotment of the compact. So as another visual representation here, if you are a graphs person, my boss insists that nobody likes graphs, but I like this graph, so you're gonna have to look at it. Um, that black line is what the river was estimated, what was divided up. This is the 10 year running average, which is important when we consider that we have to always make sure to send 75 million acre feet over 10 years to lower basin states. And you can see it really dropping off there in the end as we get into these um, hotter, drier years, 2020, 2021. 2022 uh, is gonna be a little tiny bit higher than 2021, although the numbers have not been um, totally landed on yet. This is the 100 year average since 1906 of where the river actually flows. And you can already start to see that the math is not adding up. And then flying in is the most depressing number. This is the last 10 year average of the natural flow of the Colorado River at Leaf Ferry. So you can see that the estimation was just not even close and that right now we are facing a crunch of there's far more paper water than there is wet water is one way of thinking about it. And all of that has led to a lot of national attention, headlines across every single paper, local, um, national, international. One of my jobs is I send out our bi-weekly news drop, which collects all these water headlines about what's going on. And it's everywhere. It's all across the world. People are looking at the Colorado River Basin because we are kind of on the knife edge of this um, climate change induced drought. One of the things which happened this summer is that the federal US Bureau of Reclamation asked that the Colorado River Basin states find a way to conserve between two and four million acre feet of water, which by the way is about an acre covered in one foot of water if you need a visual. And they promised to use unilateral power to bring the system back into balance if that deficit could not be met. So again, a compact between states is measure is, is enacted by the federal government. And a lot of the infrastructure is actually owned by them. Um, here's a quick view of some of that infrastructure. Now this effective date is October 14th, but the numbers haven't changed all that much. These massive storage basins, Mead, Powell, Flaming Gorge, uh, Blue Mesa is part of a, a few others as well, and then Navajo are all connected. Powell, Flaming Gorge, Blue Mesa, and the Navajo um, Reservoir are part of the Upper Basin Savings Account, basically to make sure that we can always pay our obligation to the Lower Basin. And Lake Mead is for the Lower Basin to be able to get their water needs met, even in dry years. Reservoirs made a lot of sense when the variable flow of the river was a lot higher, when we were even worried about flooding. But things have changed so much and not accounted for those changes that the system continues to be out of balance. And again, you can tell I'm summarizing a lot here and I'm trying to speak slowly. Um, so we'll keep going. I swear I'm almost done. 
One of the reasons that the federal government is most worried, uh, most interested in what is happening here has to do with the infrastructure, specifically at Lake Powell. Two things. Um, you can see that all of these different heights, this is, by the way, this is mean elevation above sea level, not from the bottom of Lake Mead or bottom of Lake Powell to the top of the water. This is sea level references. Um, 3,525 feet is this protection level that triggers management decisions because at 3,490, Glen Canyon Dam can no longer produce power through its turbines. Those turbines power at cost, so that's cheap, power across the Western Area Power Authority grid. And all of the towns across the Western Slope are going to be impacted by changes in that electrical cost if this infrastructure were to not be able to work. Even more so, however, at a lower level that you can see there, 3370, we hit Deadpool and water can't even get through the dam to get down to the lower basin. So you can see that there's less of this error, um, there's less um, room for error at this point. You know, when, when we can't produce power through um, the pen stocks that feed the turbines, they're gonna have to use these tunnels that go around the outside, which originally were intended for overflow release and which are not graded and not safe to do continual water releases. So there's a massive system, billions of dollars worth of infrastructure to be protected that we're all depending on water to be at a certain level that it's not anymore. So I'm summarizing again, just to give you this big picture of why these conversations have become so urgent. My boss would ask me to recommend that they have not become urgent quickly, but there have been many voices speaking for a while, trying to point out what was going to come. I had uh, one of these brilliant hydrologists I was speaking to describe it as a, the slowest moving semi-truck imaginable. And if we can't get out of the way, <laughs> that's our fault. So it's just something to keep in mind. Again, valid criticisms of the 1922 compact. We know a lot of mistakes were made. A lot of people were left out. Um, sovereign tribal nations that hold land within this Colorado River Basin have senior water rights in the event uh, approximately 1.5 million acre feet of which they've only developed half. If they were to actually develop and call on all of those rights, the system would owe even more and their rights are senior to any of ours because when we put those people on reservation land, it was assumed that there would be water to be able to support human life there. So their calls are senior to ours and they were not taken into account. And the best available science was ignored. At the time of the compact, 1922, there were people in the room saying, we don't have this much water. John Wesley Powell was one of the people who went along talking about how we need to base our states and our governments on the shape of the water in the land instead of straight lines. And I think the thing to draw from that though is to make sure that we're not doing that today that we are listening to the best available science and that we are making sure the decision makers have access to it. The essence of the deal is that equitable apportionment will always be important. As we move forward into these difficult conversations and as you get this background um, at any level, the all, all water users and stakeholders are going to feel the impact and we're all going to need to address the choices that we make in the lifestyle that we have out here, understanding that it is not one user group, it's not a one user group to fix everything. So something we run into is that people point fingers at agriculture because it uses 80% of the water. But it doesn't just use water, it turns it into food, which is kind of important. In fact, with a lot of the uh, supply chain issues that we're seeing globally, local food production is going to be more and more important. They have return flows, augmentation plans, and all of these other things, not to mention maintaining green space. That being said, they're also doing their best to make sure that they are efficiently using water, upgrading infrastructure, and um, taking cuts even on these, we're, we live in hydrology, right? Upper basin, there's no huge reservoir above us. We can't call water down from Lake Powell. You know, we send water down to Lake Powell. So when we run out of snow and we run out of river, that's it. We're already taking a hit. We're already taking a cut. Whereas the lower basin has never experienced that. We look at urban centers. You know, there's, there are quite a few areas in the Colorado River Basin that have recognized um, the shift in climate, that have recognized that decorative lawns and medians do not really have any place anymore when you have to irrigate grass in the middle of the desert. Uh, if you look even at the Aurora, so they rely on Colorado River water transferred across the basin, but they've recently enacted a lot of municipal decisions that were not received all that well, but are essential. Taking out that unusable turf, Colorado State, uh,
Sorry about that. Did I lose you guys? Apologize. No, that's a yeah. Sorry, Lindsay. I was about to send you something in the chat, but I just didn't want to make sure I messed it up more. <laughs> uh, no problem. I'm almost done down to the last slide, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, I just hate to leave people on the really depressing part, so I always have the end of of the so what now because we can't just point at all the problems and not offer any solutions. So just real quick to give you a shred of hope. Um, we're looking at ways to solve this problem locally. So in 2020, uh, the Colorado River District had a ballot measure which was approved with overwhelming bipartisan support across all 15 counties. That's Eagle County, Moffat County, Route County, Delta County, all of these places which hold just you know different lifestyles, different priorities, different types of water users, different politics agreed that Colorado River water needed to be supported. And it created this fantastic grant fund program called the Community Funding Partnership in less than two years, we have already approved 66 projects because of the ballot measure, which allowed for the tax increase. Um, all of this money has gone back to water users across the district to solve the problems in their own way, in their own land, boots on the ground, grassroots, any kind of cliche you want to use there. But it's been incredible um, to see these communities really come up with what do they need and, and how can we solve this here on the Western Slope, keeping in mind that we're not the only people that need to make these adjustments. Um, so that program covers productive agriculture, conservation and efficiency, watershed health and water quality, infrastructure and healthy rivers. And we only approve pro, uh, projects which are multi-benefit so that we're not just benefiting one water user, we're positively impacting uh, water users across the district. All right, so that's the end of my presentation, the very quick and dirty version of what's going on, um, but I will hang on for questions later and uh, turn it over to Mario. Thank you, Lindsay. And it was nice to have a uh, little silver lining there. Anybody that's interested can contact me and I will make sure that you get a uh, link for this one way or the other. And again, is there anybody have any questions? So we had a question from the local crowd here. Um, are we more worried about the drought or population increase? And I think that's a good question for Lindsay. A moment that we can necessarily separate the two. Both are massive impacts on our watershed health and the future outlook of our basin. So they're both realities um, and they're both realities outside of our control. So if we're talking about being worried about anything, that's really not a solution oriented approach anyway. I think the recognizing of an uncomfortable reality that we might not prefer if we could choose it is going to involve both of those things. So as we look to future decisions for water managers who are trying to plan for their communities 10, 20, 30 years into the future, um, they're going to need to take both into account with a very um, brave, honest assessment of what's going to happen um, because we can't count on either going away. And as a lot of my ag producers will say, um, praying or hoping for snow is not a drought strategy. Sure, we hope for snow. It would take years and years of, of exceptional snowpack to replenish the system from where it is right now and we would still be increasing our population growth. So what we need to do is um, make wise decisions about water use and conservation based on what we know right now and move forward with that in place, invite more voices to the table, make sure that they're being heard, that the water users who have a smaller voice in these discussions get amplified um, by those who maybe can, which again is sort of what we do at the River District, um, but yeah, as far as which one is worth, which one to be more worried about, I, I don't think we can separate them at this point. They're just our future. Sorry if that was a depressing answer. <laughs> well, and that's kind of why I wanted to bring up this idea of, you know, anthropogenic versus natural aridification and drought cycles. 
because they they can go hand in hand and it's really hard to tease apart in terms of actually uh conservation yeah where where are you going to split that variability up and who's you know who's going to get hit with the, the 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 penalty um and you're right we can't really control either one to any great extent particularly um well drought cycles i guess uh if we're worried about the planet warming up and they're putting investing money into sun shading technology, uh, we'll see how that. <laughs> In the meantime, yeah, that I mean, from a scientific standpoint, that's a tough, that's just a tough thing to tease out. You know, from a scientific, uh, hydro, hydrological standpoint. Anything else from anybody? Go ahead, Al. I'll do my best. If the lower basin states were using their allocated share, what would Lake Powell look like today? Did you get that, that, Lindsay? I did. Is that Al? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Al, how's it going? There's two of our board members listening in here, by the way, um, just as a quick structural thing that I skipped, we're governed by a board of 15 directors appointed by county commissioners to make sure that voices across the West Slope all have an equal um, an equal voice on it. And you just heard from Alvin Brink, who is our board member uh, representing Rio Blanco County. So if you're saying if they had only used their allotment, what would Lake Powell look like? Oh man, that's too many variables to isolate right there. Um, a cup, I mean, the stress factors on Lake Powell, of course, one of the big ones is continued lower basin overuse. So not only have they continued to call for the same amount of water, regardless of the intensity of the drought that we're facing, um, they are also not accounting for evaporative and trans transport losses, as well as they're not accounting for their, their tributary uses either. So when we say overuse, it is that they consistently use what is on paper without accounting for those losses or those extra incomes, if you will, of water from tributaries. Lake Powell and Lake Mead have been managed in tandem um, because of the interim guidelines when it became apparent in the early aughts that compact, um, the foundational law of the river, the compact wouldn't be enough based on the drought that they were seeing. Um, they started balancing the tiers of those two lakes. So that level in Lake Powell is now integrally connected to the level in Lake Mead. So lower basin overuse as well as that balancing act has worked in tandem to drop the levels of Lake Powell. Um, if you leave the tap open on a drain, it will continue to go down and then add to that the aridification that we've been discussing. So any one of those factors plus population growth um, can definitely account for Lake Powell's level. I think one substantive action that the federal organization which manages Lake Powell, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation is considering is that potentially beginning in 2024, that's water year 2024, so not next year, but the one after, um, they may begin to account for those evaporation losses, not transit or anything else yet, just evaporation losses out of need. And then that would sort of be um, taken out percentage. So if, if, if a water user, say, uses 4% of the, of the amount of water leaving Lake Mead, then they would account, they would, the amount of evaporation that was lost, they would subtract 4% of that amount of evaporation from that other water user's account. I don't know if it would be the same. It's almost impossible to death. Where's DK when you need him? So the bottom line is there wouldn't necessarily be more water. I mean, if they hadn't been managed in tandem, if the lower basin hadn't consistently overused, if we weren't facing 20 plus year drought, if we didn't have extreme population growth, I mean, it's just all so connected. I think that um, part of the problem is that we have siloed solutions for so long being one thing is being addressed, but not the whole system. And you can, we can all see so clearly now that it's very, very connected. Thanks, Lindsay. Anything else before we shut her down? Okay, Lindsay, much appreciated. And I appreciate everybody being here. I really do. And again, I hope that we're going to be hosting some water measurement and administration seminars 
uh, heading into January, February. So we'll keep you all apprised on that. And hopefully those will be um, useful for you too. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Mario. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Y'all take care.